Lie number one is I am too different to make a difference. That is the first of eight lies that I sometimes hear Aspies tell themselves. Aspies people with Asperger's syndrome. So as we go through these eight lies, you tell me, have you ever told yourself this lie? Well, chances are this isn't something that, uh, these aren't lies that you tell yourself all the time. Some of them may be. But these are lies that you probably told yourself in the past. And some of them maybe have stuck. They're still with you. But lie number one is, you know, if I weren't so different, uh, I could actually make a difference. To get a grasp on this principle that uh, unties this lie, and that's what we're doing here, taking the lies and untying them, I want you to, uh, I want you to visit your uh, kitchen cabinet. That would be a good place to start. And uh, that, I'm assuming, is where you keep your salt shaker. Maybe you keep it on the table. I don't know. So get out your salt shaker and uh, get out a, well, get out a salad bowl. You can get out any bowl you want, maybe a mixing bowl or whatever. But uh, let's do this exercise in our mind. You can do it literally if you want to. But in your mind, get out your salt shaker and your salad bowl. So today you're going to have salt and you're going to have salad. A little salt on your salad might uh, hurt you if you have some physical problems, but you know, a little bit, probably not. But then, uh, then you know, switch them. Decide that you're going to take the salt and put it in the salad bowl, and you're going to put the salad in the salt shaker. That's not going to work, is it? That is because the way to untie this lie is to understand the container principle, that each of us is a container, and we are designed by nature for a specific purpose. A salt shaker was designed to hold salt. That's why it's got the little holes on the top of it. The salad bowl was made for salad. Now, I don't know what your salad bowl looks like, but I eat a huge amount of salad every day. I got a massive salad bowl. It's like the salad bowl that you would serve six or seven people with, the only app it serves me. I can't imagine filling that thing up with salt and my salt shaker, you know, a little bit of salad and then eating it because they're not the same. Now we mentioned a mixing bowl. Okay, that's for mixing. What kind of container are you? You have specific designs that you can do. Some things you can do, some things you can't do. Lie number two is this. I sometimes hear Aspie say, and by the way, it's not just people with Asperger's that uh, say these things, but as I was putting together my notes, I was thinking, what are some of the lies that uh, I say to myself or have said? And uh, I have heard other people with Asperger's say these lies as well, but they're not, again, unique to people with Asperger's syndrome. Well, lie number two that we need to untie is I have uh, no uh, options. Because I am a person with uh, Asperger's syndrome, I have limited options. I find it very difficult to hold down a job because people don't, um, people just don't accept me socially. You may say that uh, I find it difficult to uh, communicate with people, which is related to I can't keep a job. And okay, so you got all these limitations. So I don't have any options. I got to tell you, I'm very sympathetic. If that is a lie you're telling yourself, I understand because I've been there so many times. I just feel like, you ever felt like that you were just in traction? You know what I mean by traction? That's where they, you have an accident and they give you a body cast and you can't move, period. Now, with that image in mind, and not somebody else in traction, but I want you to imagine you right this very moment or in the emergency room, well, not the emergency room, but wherever they put people with traction, you're in that room, and you're in a body cast. And imagine you, yourself, right now, just kind of freeze yourself, and imagine being in that position for weeks, maybe even months, you can't move. How would you like that? Um, I don't think I would like it. Some people, you know, they experience it. It saves their lives. But I'm, I'm pretty sure, I mean, these people don't have any options, but I'm pretty sure I'm not, I'm not that limited. 
you know, I can actually move around. I can get up and feed myself. I mean, granted, I have limited options relative to other people, and we'll talk about that in more detail. But um, I do have options. I can move. Compared to a person in traction, I have a lot of options. And suddenly I realize that lie is untied when I stop and focus not on my limitations, but I focus on my options relative to somebody who literally has no options. So it turns out, um, yeah, I get what you're saying. I get what I'm saying, that options are limited, but they're not uh, non-existent. Lie number three is this, failure is harmful. One of my passions is studying psychology. I love psych. I probably should have been a psychologist, but such was not the case. I turned out, uh, fortunately, I had the sense to start a business, did fairly well, didn't get tremendously wealthy, but, you know, we lived a decent life. Still am living, by the way, in case you haven't noticed. And... Um, I was studying psychology one time, which I do frequently, and I came across this principle that um, the things that we learn, we learn as a result of failure. Now, I'm wondering, did I not learn anything in school? Okay, let's say that you are in a technical school and you're studying auto mechanics. So you go to class and they teach you nothing but classroom material. They've got a chalkboard, do they still have those? When I was a kid, that's basically all they had. And those corny um, projectors, you know, they put a, uh, they'd write on the top of them and they projected on the wall, which weren't very effective, but they're better than nothing. But that was it, you know, we had books, so forth. But supposing that was it, but they didn't, you didn't actually work on a vehicle. You didn't actually work on an engine. You didn't work on the uh, undercarriage. You didn't, Learn how to change a tire by changing the tire. I mean, the point is, the only way you can learn practically is to try doing it and find out where your limitations are. Now, I mentioned I had a successful um, marketing business, and there's a thing in marketing called test marketing. The way you find out what works is find out what doesn't work and eliminate it. It's just that simple. We would do direct mail pieces. And I would put together this direct mail piece, and I'm just uh, fairly sure it's going to work. In fact, if I wasn't relatively sure it's going to work, I wouldn't test it. But I would test it because just because I think it would work, because I thought it would work, doesn't mean it will work. So I would invest some time and some money in putting together a direct mail piece, and then I'd send it out there and see what happens. More often than not, my brilliant ideas fail. They just flopped. Now, I could have thought to myself, well, uh, I must be a failure because I can't put together a decent direct mail piece. But the fact of the matter, yes, I could. I just had to go through those that didn't work till I found one that did work. And then, once you find what works, you go with that one. The principle here is failure is essential to advancement. Now let's stop and think, and we're going to go ahead in just a second, but let's go over the last three principles. Ready? Number one is this. Only people who think differently can make a difference. Because principle number one is we were saying that um, I'm too different to make a difference. Well, if you're not different, you can't make a difference. The exact opposite is true. Number two is I have no options. That is when we brought into play the traction, op uh, the traction principle, rather. Imagine yourself in traction. Okay, there you have no options. But unless you're in traction, guess what? Yeah, you do have options. Number three is failure is essential for advancement. Every time you fail, you go get a job and they fire you for no good reason other than they just don't like you. And that's not a good reason. Okay, you failed. Now you know where not to work. That's just that simple. I can't, I can't imagine Okay, I can't imagine because I've been there, done that, but uh, I'm 70 years old, almost, and I've been there, done that. That's why I do these videos, to share with others what I've been through and hopefully help them. But uh, I was going to say I can't imagine all the jobs I lost when I was in my 20s and 30s, but actually I can't imagine because I did it. But uh, it's hard to imagine that all these people thought I was uh, a failure because 
but they just didn't like my personality. Well, it turns out, and eh, guess what? Um, I just hired myself. Y'all not going to hire me? I think I got more talent than you do, or more talent than you think I do. Who's going to hire me? Hired myself. Guess what? It worked. It worked. So uh, that takes us to, now that we've learned that failure is essential for advancement, that takes us to uh, number four, that I am trapped by. Now let's just leave uh, this one open for a second. I made this statement, we are trapped by, and you finish that. You are entrapped, entrapped by what? You may feel entrapped by hurtful or hateful people. You may feel entrapped by circumstances. You may feel entrapped by autism or Asperger's syndrome. What is it that makes you feel entrapped? And by the way, everyone has limitations. Of course we do. And so, but we're not trapped in that uh, traction, in that um, uh, what else could we say? Uh, it's not like we uh, are unconscious and we can't do anything. So we say that we're entrapped, we'll say, by hurtful people, whatever. And as I was putting together my notes, um, I like I like Elvis. Uh, people think I'm a little weird, maybe I'm dated, but uh, the early music that Elvis did, I could... Uh, I could take it or leave it most of the time. I just leave it. But after his comeback in 1969, and if you're young, you may not even know who Elvis is. But uh, the song was Suspicious Minds. I think that was the last hit he had before he died. And I was thinking about the lyrics of that. I'm caught in a trap. I can't get out because I love you too much, baby. I'm sorry, but those lyrics are kind of silly. You know, I mean, does that sound like a hit song to you? I'm imagining, I did some research on this, and I looked it up. It was written by, by, by a guy by the name of Mark James. Now, it turns out that James was, uh, he was a songwriter, and uh, he was a successful songwriter. He wrote many successful songs. But if I were a record producer back in 1968, when this song was first written, and this guy came to me and said, hey, I, I got a song, I want you to hear it. He sits down at the piano, and he starts singing, and I'm caught in a trap. I can't get out because I love you too much, baby. As a producer, I would think, okay, that's, no, that's not a hit. I mean, what's the catch to it? Um, there's got to be something that sticks in your mind, you know, that you do want, that people want to hear it again and again. It's got to kick the dopamine in, you know? That's what it's all about. So I would, I would send Mark James packing on that one. Well, apparently that's what happened because Mark James recorded the song himself. And I guess the producers were correct, assuming that he took it to a producer. He may have produced it himself. I don't know. But apparently they were correct because he recorded it and it just flopped. But that was not the end of it. He still wasn't trapped. So he took a song about entrapment and uh, he thought to himself, uh, I'm, I'm assuming, what if Elvis did it? Now this is this is a uh, accomplished songwriter, wrote a lot of hits. So this is a guy that would have had access to people who had access to Elvis. Uh, he may have known him personally. I don't know. Okay, so let's, try, let's let Elvis try it. So Elvis tried it, and guess what? Big hit. So me hearing it, one guy playing it on a piano, nah, that's not going anywhere. Let's uh, put that one in the trash bin. Well, let's hear the next one you got. But uh, he didn't give up on it. He wasn't going to be caught in that trap. So he kind of actually lived out the lyrics of his song. But the principle is this. Let Elvis try it. I mean, if this doesn't work, then, okay, maybe doing it this way will work. I mean, when do you, when do you stop? When do you get to that point where you say, I'm not going to do this anymore. It's not working. Well, you come to that conclusion when you've tried everything there is to try. Unless you have something else to try. But if you know something is good, you go ahead and keep trying it the best you can. Lie number six that we need to, uh, number five rather, that we need to overcome. I hear a lot of people with Asperger's syndrome, and I tell myself this now and again, is that um, I'm not good enough. Well, what exactly is good enough um, relative to what? Well, I can assure you that 
I'm not good enough to play NBA basketball. Positively sure. Never have been good enough. I'm not good enough to sing in an opera. Unless there's an opera that calls for somebody who can't sing, uh, then I'd fit right in. Pretty good. I never make it in Hollywood. Eh, maybe I would. Who knows? But okay, I've got my limitations. I already know what I can't do because, you know, I've tried it. I tried the, uh, the uh, caught in a trap, can't get out song. And uh, now nah, it's not going to be a hit for me, but okay, it could be a hit for someone else. So I know that in some areas, I'm not good enough. Well, since we're talking about pop music back in the 1960s, I got another one for you. You ready for this? I think you are going to love this. There was a guy by the name of Jerry Dorsey. It wasn't his real name. His real name was um, his real name was Arnold Dorsey. Arnold, I think it was Arnold George Dorsey. And he was he's a really talented singer. I mean, he was good. He's one of these guys that had it, and he knew he had it. But uh, he tried. This is the story I've heard. But he tried to do some recordings, take them to the producer, and the producer said, "That's not going to be a hit." Kind of like the other guy we were talking about. So they, you know, that's in him packing. And he had one song that he recorded, and his manager was just absolutely positively convinced this would be a hit song. He just knew it because he was experienced. He'd been there, you know, that was part of his life. He had, a, had the ear for it. Well, the problem is he couldn't take it to record producers because they had heard Jerry Dorsey so many times and turned him away so many times they didn't they they didn't um want to give him any more time trick now this is a story i've heard the the manager suggested that uh, jerry dorsey change his name so when he sent in the record to the producers they wouldn't recognize him so then they would listen to it okay what do you want me to change my name to and according to the story, as I understand it, he said, well, let's change your name to Engelbert Humperdinck. And the song was, release me, you know, please release me, let me go. And it turns out, yeah, that worked. The point is, um, it was a point of reference. It was the, um, there was nothing wrong with the song, nothing wrong with the voice, nothing wrong with the performer. It was just that people had kept saying no so many times that you had to find a way to get around the no's, had to find a way to get around the barriers. Had to stop and think, what is a route that I can take to get the job done? And it's not that you're not good enough. It's often that other people don't recognize it. But know what you are good at. Know what you're not good at. And if you are good at it, go for it. Line number five is, I'm not good enough, according to other people. What about according to you? Because, hey, nobody knows you more than you do. So I call this the uh, Jerry Dorsey principle. Or you could call it the uh, Engelbert Humperdinck principle. Number six is this. I don't have enough. This is another one of those fill in the blanks. I don't have enough. I don't have enough. That's, is that a lie? Don't have enough relative to what? Well, I don't have enough talent, as I said earlier, to play NBA basketball. I don't have enough time to do everything I would like to do. Um, maybe I don't have enough friends. If you have Asperger's syndrome, you probably have an extremely, extremely limited circle of friends. I don't have, um, I don't have enough money. Enough money to do what? Well, again, this all comes back to what we mentioned several times before, and that is your point of reference. Um, what is your point of reference? Well, you are comparing yourself to something. What are you comparing yourself to when you say that um, I don't have enough? Well, are you saying that um, I don't have enough money? Uh, I don't have a good enough vehicle to make the trip? What, you don't have enough what? Well, what I like to do in my mind when I get in that, that frame of mind is I like to change my point of reference so that I not only have enough, I have more than enough. What, what do I mean by that? Well, look, what do I have compared to my point of reference now is not going to be the neighbor next door or the people who live on the better side of town. But my point of reference this time, I'm going to shift it. 
to my ancestors. Go back 200 years. Okay, I, I just don't have enough to buy a new Cadillac. Sorry, I just don't have enough money. Well, go back 200 years to your ancestors, or even 100 years probably, and chances are they didn't have enough money to even buy a vehicle. Go back far enough, which is almost all of human history, thousands and thousands of years, the wealthiest people on the planet couldn't afford the simplest, cheapest piece of junk automobile. If you have a car, even if it doesn't run, you have more than most people have had throughout all of history. Now, we don't think of it in those terms. But sometimes I will drive into my neighborhood, typical middle class, I mean literally middle class neighborhood. The house that we live in, uh, if you have it valued, I mean this is just right smack in the middle. We live in, a, in the middle of the middle class. And you drive through the neighborhood and you could think, you know, wouldn't it be nice to have a big house and live uh, like wealthier people live? But then I stop to consider as I'm looking around everything from the pavement to the sewer system to the uh, lawnmowers that keep our lawns cut to our central plumbing, our air conditioner, our heating system, uh, all of those things, when the point of reference is how people lived in the past, we are extremely, extremely wealthy. Drives me nuts when people in the United States and other Western countries complain that they don't have enough. Some of them, I guess, you know, are really hurting. But by and large, most of the people complaining, really what they're saying is, I don't have as much as other people. Not that I don't have enough. Uh, some of them are complaining because they have a weight problem. Throughout all of human history, the biggest concern was not having enough food to eat. Now we're complaining because, well, we have too much. To read. So it's a point of reference, you know? So if you say, I don't have enough time, I don't have enough talent, I wish I were better at this, I wish I had more than that, well, what's your point of reference? The reason is because you are comparing yourself, or I am comparing myself, to something that uh, I should not be comparing myself to. Just that simple. Turns out, you know what? I don't actually need a new Cadillac. Be nice to have one. Somebody wants to donate one, hey, no problem, I'll take it. Just park it in my driveway and leave the keys, see you later. Number seven is this, let's undo this line. The principle, by the way, was change your point of reference for number six. Number seven is my past predicts my future. What happened to me in the past is going to predict what happens to me in the future. Well, that's, that's a lie. Because you don't know your future, I mean, this one should be kind of obvious, but, uh, you know, your past experience does give you clear insight as what your abilities are, and more importantly, what your abilities are not. So you've got that insight, but that's not the be-all, end-all of the story. The way that I like to phrase this or think of this is, you know, I've lost like 100 pounds the last few years, and uh, I got to where... Um, I just miserable, you know, couldn't get out of a chair, had to struggle, couldn't walk without losing breath. And uh, this principle occurred to me. And this is something for you to take away. The principle is what you eat today, talking to myself in the mirror, what you eat today is what you wear tomorrow. And if you don't want to wear it tomorrow, don't eat it today. How hard is that? Well, it's harder than you think if you ever tried it. Try going an entire 24 hours and eat nothing. That's not a suggestion. I'm just saying think about doing that. And how, how would you feel at the end of 24 hours? Well, I tried it a couple times, and it turns out it wasn't quite as hard as I thought it would be. But, uh, yeah, at the end of 24 hours, you're ready to eat. But when you stop to think of not that your past is going to predict your future, but you start to think that your present predicts your future, and that is the principle that we cling to. Once again, it's not my past predicts my future, but it is my present predicts my future. And then finally is number eight. This is a lie we need to undo, we need to untie. That is, I need no one. People with Asperger's syndrome get caught in this trap, get caught in this lie many times because we don't have that support group that other people have. We just don't have it. And so we finally come to the conclusion that, 
Okay, I just don't need anybody. Well, let's untie that lie. I want you to imagine, and there's one thing I would love to do, and that is to live on an island all by myself. Or more, I think I would rather live out in the woods, maybe next to a lake, maybe on the side of a mountain, beautiful view all by myself. World, leave me alone. But if we drill down with that concept, what would happen if we actually did that? Only we cut off everybody. No influence whatsoever from anybody. Just leave me alone. Well, somebody else made these clothes, you know? So, uh, this is kind of a disgusting thing to think about, but if I'm going to cut off everybody and everyone else's influence, I won't have a shirt on my back, literally, because someone else made it and I'm cutting them out of my life. I can't use, I can't say anything, because this language I speak, I wasn't born doing this, somebody else taught it to me. I didn't plan on getting it, but there, I got it, they influenced me. So, I want you to imagine a little baby who is born and left out like the Spartans did, just left the baby out in the wilderness. What are the chances of the baby surviving? The answer is zero. So what we're saying here is this concept that I don't need anyone, never have, never will, if it weren't for others, we just wouldn't be here. We'd be like that baby that the, Spart the Spartans, why can't I say Spartans? The Spartans left out in the wilderness. And unless someone came by and rescued the baby, the baby just died because we are all dependent on others. So yeah, I get, I get what we mean when we say that, and sometimes I say it to myself. You know, I really don't need others, or maybe I'm too dependent, too rely, I'm relying too much on other people. But uh, that may have some truth to it. But the fact of the matter is, yeah, we're all connected. So the principle is living alone, where we have no clothes, no language, no instruction, know how to eat off the land, nothing, no influence whatsoever from other people, not going to happen. Now, by the way, if you hear some noise in the background and it sounds like rain on a tin roof, that's because what you're hearing is rain on a tin roof. And that, my friends, is why I wear a headset, so I can help eliminate or reduce some of those uh, exterior sounds. See those two? Uh, rectangles on the screen would you please click on one of those if you want the conversation to continue but if you're done talking well thanks for stopping by and we will see you all next time